Hi everyone, it's good to connect with you. I hope your first week of school has gone well. So let me first say, you have an assignment due on Friday, your, your self-introduction. Some of you have already turned some in and, and I've started reading them, so, so good job. So they're due Friday, that's when your first assignment is, is due. So it should be pretty straightforward. We're gonna introduce ourselves to each other. Now, you're going to get your first lecture, your first discussion from Professor Joseph James. Joe is a, an associate professor at the University of Washington in the Information School. His teaching research is in the evolution, history, impacts, and uses of information resources and documentary reforms. He's the creator of a podcast called Documents That Change the World. I've listened to these, to these podcasts, and they're really quite wonderful. You should listen to them. You should Google Joe and, and look for documents that change the world and listen to some of them and think about the choices that he made for documents that he thinks change the world. And you can imagine yourself, what documents do you think change the world? What would you add to the podcast if you were to create your own? It's a wonderful series. So Joe, when you see his lecture, he starts out with something seemingly very simple and something very modest. And so he's not gonna provide a um, readings for you, but he's going to provide text for you. So listen to his lecture and treat it like you would a text. So I ended up taking notes. I took four pages of notes during Joe's lecture. And he starts out with artifacts that he's collected from his mother and his father, seemingly simple things, documents that he's collected from them. While you're watching this, take notes again and think about what documents that you've collected yourself. What documents were passed on from, from your family? What documents that do you hold yourself? That might be documents that you want to keep. Maybe even documents you want to contribute to the time capsule we'll talk about eventually. So Joe starts with family keepsakes and then he moves his way to talk about 10,000 year old documents. So much as a handprint on a, on a rock that will last for, forever. We all have stuff, Joe says, and some of it's fleeting, some of it's temporary, and some of it's meant to last forever. What's the stuff that you have that is fleeting, Snapchat? What stuff do you have that you want to hold on to and maybe pass on so that, um, so that you will be re remembered? Um, Joe eventually helps us talk about this time capsule. And I describe in my conversation with Joe, the idea of a time capsule for 2020 for you actually comes from a conversation that I've had with colleagues and with Joe. We were walking across campus and he said to me, I hope that students, I hope that people in 2020 will remember to write down things, to hold on things, because historians will want to know how you felt and how you experienced this moment in time. And we thought together and we thought a time capsule would be really a wonderful idea. Joe says something in his lecture that I want you to think about. He says, 2020 will be a year that we will never forget, but we will not be eager to remember. It's interesting that we will never forget, but we will not be eager to remember. Is that true for you? Let's think about that along with Joe in his lecture. In the end, he says something that I want you to, to pay attention to because he says that we all want to be able to say that I was here, that I mattered, and I have a story to tell and I want to be remembered. He says, we want to be heard, understood, and remembered. Think about that. Think about how you want to be remembered. Enjoy Joe's lecture. I'll be talking to you soon. Hello there, I'm Joseph Jaynes. I'm an associate professor in the information school at the University of Washington. I've been at the UW for a little over 20 years. I was actually one of the founding faculty of what is now the information school or the iSchool as we know it. I'm absolutely delighted to be at UW and in the iSchool and, and to be here to share some thoughts and, and ideas with you about objects, memory, the future, and you. So I thought I'd start with a few objects and memories um, for me. Um, and some of these you'll be able to see more easily than others, but um, I, just, this will get us started. So um, among the things that I found when my uh, mother passed away several years ago was that I never knew we had was, this is the bill for my hospital delivery. <laughs> so this is the bill from the hospital. I was in the, uh, my mom was in the hospital for four days, which I don't think happens very much anymore. Here's the bill from the doctor. So this is kind of cute. And, you know, you save this stuff because it's a memento of I'm an only child. So this was right. But I also have and this will just tell you everything you need to know about my family. Um, I also have the, the checks that they used, <laughs> the canceled checks that paid for my delivery and and the receipt. So I have a receipt. <laughs> 
for whatever good. I, I, my guess is my mother kept this because she wanted to be sure that, you know, she had credit for having paid for everything. But on the other hand, now I have a receipt, which is kind of cool. Um, I also have from my mother, this is considerably older. This is a, a food ration book. During World War II, my, my mother was a teenager during World War II. During World War II, a lot of different kinds of foods were rationed. And for whatever reason, she saved her ration book. And again, this was my mother. There's like one stamp left for, a, for uh, it's no good anymore. I don't think I couldn't take this to the store to get anything, but I think that's a meat stamp. It's got an M on it, if you can see it. So, uh, you know, again, I think she kept this, you know, you never know if that stamp's gonna be useful at all, but also just, it was a keepsake. It was a memento, right? Um, uh, this, this is two. Sorry if that's super loud on your end. Um, this is a cowbell. You can see it says Go Canada on it. I got this from the Vancouver Public Library. Uh, when my husband and I went up to Vancouver for the opening ceremony of the Olympics in 2010, I had a friend who worked at Vancouver Public Library and they were giving these out. So um, so I have, a. this is among the mementos I have of that trip that, that we took. Um, this, this changed my life. So I went to, I did all my, my degrees at Syracuse University because uh, I grew up in upstate New York. And um, uh, this brochure for what was then the School of, still is the School of Information Studies at Syracuse, lays out, you know, everything they do and all the courses they teach. And, and this made no sense to me at all as an undergraduate when I was trying to figure out what to do. And, and this, this really helped me find the field, find the discipline that I was meant to be in. Um, and so I, and I kept this because, I mean, then it doesn't, it's no, uh, no, no use other than historical at this point, but I kept it because it, it, it represented a time in my life when I was making powerful decisions and, you know, just, just it, that and the fact that they were just deeply kind to me and very compassionate and welcoming uh, made all the difference in the world to me. Um, and then I can't talk about my mom without talking about my dad. This is another thing I came across um, when going through family stuff that I never knew existed. So you won't be able to see this very well, but this is a certificate of literacy for my father. Um, and it's from the uh, State of New York Education Department. And from what I can tell, and I've done some research on this because I've never seen this before, this was a literacy test to allow him to vote. So in New York State, this is dated 1947, um, after he had come back from World War II. So he fought in World War II for his country, and then he had to prove that he could read and write to be able to vote. He never spoke about this, whether he'd forgotten about it, but somehow it was kept, whether he forgot about it, whether he was ashamed of it, whether he was proud of it, I, I have no idea. Um, he left school in the eighth grade. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Um, uh, and there's probably deeper connections to other things going on in, in these pieces of paper. These are just two copies of the same thing. But, you know, each of these things tells stories. And I'm gonna now start up the slides here in earnest so you can see it. Each of those things tell stories. Um, some of them are quite personal to me, but we could, all, we could say that all of those are now informing things. But if you notice, each of them uh, has different roles to play. Um, originally, many of them had some sort of documentary or functional role. So the bill, the receipts, uh, the checks, the certificates, the brochure, uh, the ration books, all of those things were meant to do something, you know, documenty or functional or do some work. The, the cowbell's a different story. Um, but now they're doing other work. None of those things is doing what they were originally meant to do. The brochure kind of is, but the, all of these things are now family keepsakes. They're, they tell me stories about my family and about me. Um, so they're doing a different kind of work um, than they were originally intended to do. We all have examples like this. You, everybody has, you know, keepsakes, mementos, um, objects, all kinds of things that help us to remember um, help us to tell these kinds of stories, pass these kinds of stories down, etc. cetera. Um, so what we have here are objects that are telling stories intentionally and otherwise. Um, these things originally had an intent and a function, and now they're doing different things kind of unintentionally, but that's because of the layers we've added of memory. 
So these are situational and personal. I have different memories based on these objects than other people would because they're mine. Um, they do different work at different times. That's the situational component to this. Some of these things have institutional memory, organizational memory, cultural, societal memory. Um, and this is kind of what I do. My, my area of scholarly interest is documents and forms of documents, genres of documents, how they evolve, the work they do, the kind of social and cultural impacts they have, et cetera. Um, so that, that's what I want to spend our time with. And, and in particular, in thinking about these things and the work they do, um, I want to raise some questions. And these are very basic fundamental questions. First of which is why? why? Why do we keep things to help us remember? Why do we want to, or in some cases, have to remember? Why do we use things to help us? Well, there's, there are obvious answers to these, right? I mean, there are aspects of these um, stories that I might have, I never knew some of these stories when I was growing up. Um, I, I certainly remember the decision making I did to, to find information science as a discipline, as a field that I would spend the rest of my life in. But keeping coming across that brochure every now and again kind of brings it all back. Um, there are parts of that time I don't want to remember particularly well. I was miserable. I was homesick. I was I was I was in a bad spot for quite a while um, and I found my way out of it. So there's parts of those stories that I want to remember. There's parts that I don't. Um, but it all, you know, kind of all comes as a piece. And these objects kind of help us to do it. The other thing, so at an individual level, we do these, in order to, you know, organizational, institutional level, we do these things because that's, it's kind of what we do. But I would also say that there's, a, there's an aspect of this is that we just can't help doing this. We as human beings, um, we can't help it. We are, we are, naturally, natively, all of us information creatures. And, and here's some examples of this. Fan fiction. Um, you know, many of us are fans of particular, uh, you know, stories or universes, et cetera, the Harry Potter universe, the Star Wars universe, the Star Trek universe, Marvel, right? The Brontes. There's all kinds of examples of this. And, you know, you can read the Harry Potter novels, you can watch the movies, there's plays, there's all kinds of such. And then some people write fan fiction. Um, to kind of add their own aspects to the stories. We just sort of do that. Um, here's an example of graffiti. This is about 2,000 years old. This is uh, first century Rome. Um, that's Peregrinus. Now, you probably can't make much sense out of those letters, but you can sort of see some of them, Peregrinus. Um, and this is somebody just making fun of him because he's got a big nose. Um, graffiti is ancient. There's graffiti on the pyramids. There's gra graffiti in, in uh, Pompeii. There's graffiti everywhere. This is a very human thing to do. If there's a wall, I'm going to scratch my name on it. That's what we do. Um, selfies. Um, I personally don't get why people Instagram their food, but they do. Um, they take selfies. This is the most tweeted picture ever. I think still the most tweeted picture ever from the Oscars several years ago. Um, you know, we just, that's why people take, we, people painted self-portraits 150 years ago. Now we take selfies. Um, this is a, a piece of jawbone, we think, that's about 30,000 years old. And you may be able to see at the bottom there, you see those little markings that are sort of getting bigger and bigger and they're kind of round and then they get smaller. Um, we think, it's archaeological, so everybody disagrees, we think that that may be a representation of the lunar cycle, that tens of thousands of years ago, people um, looked up in the sky and could see the moon changing every night and somehow wanted to record that, remember it, predict it, who knows, right? But, but the, that could be one of the earliest objects we have that, that show marks that were intended to endure. Um, this is a... I love this example as well. I love all of these. This is an example of something called Samizdat, this is, which is Russian for self-publishing. During the Soviet period in Russia, um, the means of communicating and recording and sharing information were deeply restricted, printing presses, typewriters, that sort of thing. This is long before the internet, long before computers. So uh, people would smuggle out these um, uh, individual little messages and pieces of paper typed illegally um, on um, uh, very flimsy pieces of paper. If any of you read um, the Gulag Archipelago, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel, that was Samizdat, that was smuggled out a piece at a time. Um, uh, doing something like this during the Soviet period in Russia 
could have easily put you in jeopardy, could have landed you in jail or even worse. So even in fear of pretty dire consequences, um, people sent messages. They had to tell their stories. They had to be heard. They had to record their feelings, what was going on. Um, and uh, I, I think all of these things are just examples of the fact that we just can't help it. We do these things naturally. We are naturally information creatures. Um, the impulse and desire and need to record is ancient as is the desire to keep and preserve. Um, so you, you know, once you have these things, you have to have somewhere to put it. Um, so that's things like libraries, archives, museums, other kinds of repositories, um, both societally, that's why we have you know, great libraries and large museums and so on, and individually, the stuff that I have here. Um, and you know, we all have individual people have scrapbooks and photo albums and family quilts and family Bibles and other kinds of artifacts. There's a whole variety of these things that people keep um, to remember and to be remembered. Um, and that's, that, uh, we will return to that. Second question we might ask is how do we do this? Well, so here's the, here's the technical part of the talk. Stuff gets created, right? <laughs> When automobiles become uh, commonplace in North America, um, people just start driving them. There's no driver's licenses because nobody knows what they're doing. Actually, car registrations came first. It was more important to register the cars than the drivers at the beginning. Not quite sure why. But eventually, people figure out and they pass laws that if you're going to drive a car, you should know what you're doing. So we have a driver's license. And that has some work. It fulfills a purpose. It'll, it, it demonstrates that you have passed a driver's test and can drive a car legally. Well, but you also use it, you know, you use it for ID, you use it for getting on an airplane, you use it, you know, it has lots of, other, mine has a blood donor thing on it. It has all kinds of other functions far beyond what it was originally intended for. Hmm. Um, you know, I have a grocery list because I got to go to the store today. I got to, you know, text messages for all these, all these things are created to do some kind of work, to fulfill some kind of function. Some of those things are you know, instantaneous and fleeting. The best example of that is Snapchat. You do a snap, it's over. In theory, they actually keep them, but we won't get into that right now. Um, some of the things, these things are really temporary. You know, When I get home from the store, I just crumple up the grocery list and throw it in the recycling. I don't pay any attention to it anymore. Some of this stuff is ephemeral. Um, so think of the notes, these are my lecture notes. The less you see of my lecture notes, the better. Um, this is pretty ephemeral stuff. Um, it, it's going to kind of come and go. Many of these things, you know, the ration book was intended to be ephemeral. The checks were, right? They do their thing and they're gone, but my mom kept them, so now they're not. Um, the ration book now has had a longer life than it ever would have done. Some of these survived, but these were, you know, when the war was over, these were no longer needed. So a lot of them got destroyed or lost or all kinds of things. Some things, so some of the longer lasting things can happen by accident. Some things last a very long time. Um, for example, the Rosetta Stone, um, which many of you probably know about. Most people know it as the, the artifact that allowed us to understand the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic language. This is, the, this is something called the, the text here, which nobody knows about. Um, it's something called the Decree of Memphis, written in Demotic, uh, 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 Greek and hieroglyphics. Um, and you, you can use the three to understand each other. That wasn't the original intent, but that's what it was. Uh, I mean, this was meant to last forever. The ancient Egyptians were not messing around when they said something was forever. They are by, by 200 BCE, they'd already been at it for several thousand years. So they meant it. Um, this by the way, is what the Rosetta stone almost always looks like. <laughs> that's the crowd. Uh, um, in front of it at the British Museum the last time I was there. Um, but it was never, it's, it doesn't, it's not doing the work it was originally intended to do to sort of prop up the dynasty. Um, uh, it was hacked off. Part of it was used as a building stone. It was dug up by the French during the Napoleonic era. They lost it immediately to the British. It's been in the British Museum for a couple of hundred years now. They're not letting it go, um, uh, despite what the Egyptians say, and for that matter, the French. Um, but so it survived quite unintentionally and, and doing very different work than it was originally intended to do, but it does persist. Um, another question we might ask about memory and objects is for whom are we doing this? Well, sometimes it's just for you. 
Um, you, know, you make notes to yourself, you keep a diary or a journal or a blog. Sometimes it's just for you. Sometimes it's for other people. So you send a text message to a friend, you, uh, you know, send a Facebook, you post a Facebook post to your friends, you send something to your family, et cetera, um, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes the intention is for everybody. So if you're going to publish a book, if you're going to stream a song, if you're going to write a, make a podcast, that sort of thing, that can be for anybody and everybody. And you want those to be widely available. In any of those circumstances, when you're creating and um, you know sharing uh, or 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 making available some sort of informing object, um, all kinds of things are going on you are making decisions about what it is and what it looks like and what it says and, and how it's meant to work. There are intentions involved. Excuse me, there are omissions involved. And it's always worth pointing out when we're talking about what we might loosely call the human record here, um, the record of what has gone before and what it, kind of what it means to be human, that there are always people in stories that are unrecorded or that have just been lost. Um, you can imagine all the things that have been created and never kept or just not found. Every once in a while, you always read these stories about they find a new manuscript of a novel or a play or a poem or something in a, in a museum or an archive somewhere. Um, so there are things that are just not, that are there, but they're just not found um, or they're ignored or are destroyed intentionally or unintentionally or censored for that matter, or just forgotten. There's things that have just been forgotten, people and stories that have just been forgotten. And when we think about the human record, when we think about the record of who we are and who we have been, it's a partial record and it will always be a partial record. Um, there's no way that it can't be a part, even in a, even in a world where everything's digital and everything's kept and everything, you know, they're, they're, everything's being tracked, it's a partial record and it always will be. Um, sometimes it's an intentionally partial record. This, this is also in the British Museum. This is around the corner from the, Rosetta Stone, and very few people look at this because they're all looking at the Rosetta Stone around the corner. Uh, this is a sarcophagus lid. This is a 150 years or so before the Rosetta Stone. And of course, we don't know who this is because the head's been chopped off. Um, this is an example of, a, of an ancient phenomenon called the Damnatio Memoriae, literally the damnation of the memory. So you find coins where the face of a previous ruler has been chipped off. You find examples like this of statues or sarcophagi or other kinds of um, uh, you know, figures where the head is gone or the face is gone. Documents were destroyed, papyri were burned, parchment was burned, There's uh, books have been burned, right? There are all kinds of ways in which the record is intentionally interrupted, um, is intentionally partial. So whenever you see a collection or a repository, here's a old picture of the Boston Public Library, the first public library in North, one of the first public libraries um, in North America in the mid of the 19th century, Here's another collection or repository. That was the, that's what Google used to look like back when they had to explain to people what Google is. Whenever you see a collection or a repository, a library, a website, a museum, an archive, in the back of your mind, you should be thinking not only what's in there, but what's not and why isn't it? And how did it get that way? And who decided and how did they get to decide? Because those decisions are always inherent in every collection, every personal collection, every institutional collection, every museum, every library, every archive, every website, everything. Who, what's there, what's not, who's there, who's not, why, who decided, and how they get to decide. Um, lots of people know the play Hamilton, the musical Hamilton. Um, and one of the lines that people always remember out of Hamilton is who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Well, yeah, who tells your story? but who keeps your story? Who preserves your story and how and why? So that's just another way of thinking about it. One specific example of the way in which we try to influence future memory, if you wanna think of it that way, of kind of nudging memory along, so to speak, um, are time capsules. These are intentional collections of a bunch of stuff uh, meant to represent a particular time or a particular place. So you are selecting things. And there's examples of this. This goes back, you know, in the, in the ancient world, they would, they would bury things in, in cornerstones and buildings as a kind of sanctification. We still, every once in a while, find uh, material in cornerstones that were meant to, you know, for some sort of 
ritual, religious purpose, et cetera. Um, sometimes there are accidental time capsules. People find stuff, you know, walled up in the wall when they're doing renovation, like, oh, look, here's an old newspaper from 80 years ago. Those kinds of things are interesting. Um, but the point of an intentional time capsule is that it's meant to represent and explain the present to an unknown future. Doesn't always work. There's a whole literature about time capsules that don't work, <laughs> that didn't work. Um, that, uh, you know, were empty or water got in or stuff degraded or all kinds of horrible things happen. So it doesn't always work. Um, but this is another kind of intentionality. We have, we have individual objects that are intentionally trying to do some sort of work. This is another kind of intentionality to, um, uh, to intentionally present ourselves to the future. Um, one, one author has referred to time capsules as a posed portrait rather than a sort of candid picture of what you get, you know, it just stuff survives, a posed portrait, I love that. Um, also that requires decisions. What gets in, what doesn't, who decides, how do they decide? Those are all important questions. So for example, what goes here? What might we think of, what might we choose to represent the 2020? What might, what might be in this picture someday in the future of something to represent um, uh, this year. So let me come back for just a second. I have one more object to show you. And this is one of my most precious treasured possessions. This is a Christmas ornament, I think. It's Christmas ornament now um, that I inherited from my grandmother. Um, as a child growing up, I always referred to this as my grandmother's egg. It's pretty obviously a lemon, but I still call it the egg. Um, and she also was uh, important to me, not only because she was my grandmother, but because she made my college education possible. She saved money out of her social security pension for as long as I was growing up. And then that paid for a good chunk of my college education. So I'm always greatly indebted uh, to my grandmother and um, all of her sacrifices on my behalf. I, I ran across the egg not that long ago, lemon, whatever. I, I ran across it not that long ago and was thinking about my grandmother and particularly thinking that she was born in 1898, very end of the 19th century. So in 1918, 19, um, during the flu pandemic, she was about 20 years old, about the age of our incoming students this year, give or take. Um, she never said a word about that. Um, as long as uh, you know, I knew her until I was in college. Um, she died at the end of my first semester of college. She never said a word, never said a word about what that was like as a young girl, as a young woman. Um, and, and actually th there's relatively little material from the flu pandemic. Um, part of it is because it was all wrapped up with the end of World War I, but there's, there's not a lot of, you know, it's kind of firsthand documentary evidence of the of the 1918-19 flu pandemic. So I think it's quite possible that 2020 is a year that we will never forget, but we will not be eager to remember. Um, there is already a tendency to not use the words. So we, so we talk about this as um, that time or this year or challenging times. I think in the future, particularly as we all hope, um, this period draws to an end. Look, I'm doing it now. Um, we're gonna be using euphemisms and allusions and, and other phrases than the COVID pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. I, I think people are going to be unwilling to dig into detail about this. Even in a world where so much is being documented, um, I, I think there will be a tendency to kind of pull back and not wanna talk about it. So think, so what institutions are doing, what libraries and museums and archives and other kinds of institutions and, and, and repositories are doing is collecting material, collecting posters and images and artifacts and documents and, and whatever they can get to, to document and represent this period for the future. There's so little, we, there's so much we don't know about what uh, what experiences people had, what thoughts people had during the uh, flu pandemic of the uh, of the 19 teens that that we want many people want to be able to remember and represent that um, for the future. 
this is an opportunity to not only provide facts and figures and number of cases and doses of vaccine and whatever other you know factual material we have, but to provide context, to provide shape, detail, focus for people of the future who are going to want to know what this time was like and how we felt about it and how we reacted. What was it like? How did you feel? What were your experiences? Uh, what was your connection to all this? People are gonna want to know this. So in the end, memory is all we have. Um, and that's the why. Um, memory in the end is all we have. So that is why we keep things, we remember these stories. In an important sense, you are your record. All the bits and pieces that represent who you are and what you are and so on, you are that record because that will survive you and your record is you, and you will be remembered by what you leave behind. And I wanna leave you with a couple more kind of really important uh, examples of what it means to be remembered by what is left behind. This is a cuneiform tablet. Many of you have seen cuneiform before. This is done with wet clay and a, a particular kind of stick called a stylus, and it makes these characteristic uh, wedge shapes. This is from ancient Sumeria. Um, and, you know, clay tablets with cuneiform have been found all over the, uh, all over the Middle East. Um, this is a particular one called the Exaltation of Inanna. Uh, this is 2300 BCE, so this is 4300 years ago. The Exaltation of Inanna is a hymn, a poem, written by a woman, the high priestess Enhejuana, the daughter of the first king of Ur in ancient Sumeria. Um, and she wrote this hymn to her goddess, Inanna, um, praising Inanna and thanking her for wreaking vengeance on somebody who did her wrong. Now, we don't know who did her wrong and we don't know what wrong was done, but we know Enhejuana. And the reason we know in Hejuana is that she used her name in this tablet. She uses the first person, she says I, and then she uses her name. And that is how we know her name. There is no other way we would know her name. So because she used her name, wrote it in there, and it survived for 4,300 years, we know the name of Hejuana. She is also, as far as we know now, the first known author. The first person we know of who put their name on a work like this to say, I wrote this, this is me. So she's one of the first earliest women whose names we know, and she is the first known author of anything. 4,300 years later, the first known author of anything. Who lives, who dies, who keeps your story? Uh, here's in Hejuana. This is a, 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 a little limestone disc showing her leading a worship service. This does not have her name on it, but the exaltation does. And then I end with this. I often talk about this in presentations and such. This is a, a, a cave wall in Argentina. Um, this is about 10,000 years ago. There are examples of this all over the world, seemingly all over the world, every continent except Antarctica has some example of cave art, some of it's figurative with animals and squid, but some of it's abstract. But in many cases, you have these hand stencils. This, you know, somebody put their hand, somebody put their hand on the surface of that rock 10,000 years ago and blew pigment on it, either out of their mouth or through a, a reed or a hollowed out bone or something like that, and then took their hand away and you're left with that image, which is just, so evocative to me, so kind of haunting, right? And when I see that handprint, we don't actually know what these were meant to be, but when I see that handprint, what I see is somebody saying, I was here and I mattered and I had a story to tell and I left my mark and I wanna be remembered. Many times what we're doing here is helping the future to know us, to understand us, our experiences, our thoughts. Um, it's so much better when we have this kind of context. We don't know what this was meant to do. We don't know what my father felt about that certificate. Um, we don't know how my grandmother felt about the pandemic. I would love to know those things. With that kind of context and texture explanation, the why, the what and the who and the how are just that much more compelling. Because in the end, we do all want to be heard, we all want to be understood, and we want to be remembered. 
Um, I hope this has been interesting. I hope this gets you thinking about yourself and, and the objects in your life and the ones you will create and how you'll be remembered. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. Take care. Dr. Joe James, thank you very much for your lecture. I thoroughly Dr. Ed Taylor, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Joe, the title of your, can I call you Joe for oh, any yeah. part of the students in our community? Yes. Um, the title of your, of your talk, you chose it, Objects, Memory, the Future, and You. Tell us about that title and why you chose that for the course 2020. Um, I, I might as well be honest. Those were the things I, were gonna, I was going to talk about, and I didn't have a good name for the whole thing. So I just threw every, it's a kitchen sink sort of thing. I just threw everything in there. Um, but I also wanted to draw the connection between those things that were, uh, that I was going to talk about memory and how memory is informed by objects and how the future is affected by that and then trying to make it personal. So it's a little bit of, I just couldn't come up with anything better and, and a little bit intentional. So everything but the kitchen sink. Now, speaking of the kitchen sink, where are you as you've done this, this lecture? Is that your kitchen sink behind you? <laughs> I, I am in what I laughingly refer to as my dining room, um, which hasn't been my dining room for quite some time. Um, the kitchen is behind me. You don't need to know what's behind that wall right there uh, or what goes on anywhere else here. But yes, I'm in, uh, I'm in my house here in Northeast Seattle. Um, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day and happy to talk with you. Which is part of just such an important reflection on 2020 because you, like so many of our faculty, are in your homes and in our, in, and in our kitchens. Um, you started your, your talk with documents you found from your mother and your father, family documents, and you're making the case that those family documents are significant, bills, recipes, a ration book. Talk, talk about, and I thought that was so powerful. Talk about those choices. Did you, did you think about those? Did you happen to have those? How did you come to those objects and what, what point were you making to us? Um, yeah, I use those uh, in various classes. Um, they're just things. I, 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 as I said in the lecture, I, I ran across most of those while I was going through, you know, as, as most of us, many of us do in our lives when, when stuff is left to us um, by people who have gone, um, you know, you just sort of go through the boxes and you find the stuff that you remember and you find the stuff that you have no idea what it is and it, off it goes. And then, so I just ran across these things. Uh, you know, the, my mother was a saver, um, as am I. I get it, but I come by it honestly. And I, none of these things, none of the things that I showed um, had I ever seen or had anybody ever talked about. Um, the ration book, the, the receipt for the check that paid for my delivery, which, okay, I can at least, I have a receipt, right? If anybody needs to return me, then the, I have a receipt. Um, the, the literacy certificate from my father, nobody, I, I imagine some of that stuff was long forgotten. Uh, my mother kept it because it was probably originally to keep it in case she needed to prove that I was paid for. Um, and then I think after that, it either was forgotten or it was just a keepsake. And, and I have similar things. Um, but those just, uh, you know, the, I run across those things and I just think, wow, you know, the, the, what, what journey has this taken? What trip has this taken? What has this been? Um, partially because I'm just like that and partially because it's, it's you know, uh, my scholarly interest as well. You also held on to a brochure from your undergraduate studies in which you found your field at Syracuse University. It ends up being a powerful document for you. And you held on to that. Did you do that intentionally or was that happenstance? Uh, yes. Uh, I think at the beginning, I just hung on to it because I hung on to it, you know, in the very first days. And, and I read that thing. I can't tell you how many times I read that thing. Um, and it didn't make a great deal of sense to me. And then it made slightly more and then it made slightly more and on and on and on go. So I probably just hung on to it because I hung on to it. And, uh, and I think sort of fail to throw it away is probably a better characterization of it. Uh, and then as time went on, I would kind of run across it every time I moved, every time, and I, oh, well, I might as well hang on to that because it meant something to me back in 1979 and so on. And now it's, now it's 40 years old. Now it, you know, who knows how many others of those survived? Who else would have cared? You know, a brochure from a, you know, graduate school from 40 years ago. Um, so now it's historic. I'm just that old. Um, but, um, but it also has, has very deep, uh, very deep associations, very deep meaning for me. On a you first make time. the case in your talk that family keepsakes and other documents do different work at different times. So for students, undergraduate, doctoral, 
the class paper does a certain amount of work now, but it does mm-hmm. something very different 40 years from now and maybe worth mm-hmm. keeping. A gift or an ornament, and you spoke about an ornament that you held on, does does different work at different times. Talk about that concept of documents doing different work. At different times. Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, if you think about, I mean, we're all surrounded by things. Uh, some of those things are meant to be informational or to carry some information or to, you know, perform some function. I use the example of my driver's license. Um, you could think of, you know, a, a, a bill, a receipt, a grocery list, uh, you know, the, that brochure. I, I still have an exam I took in grad school that I got one question wrong and it infuriated me that I was that stupid for getting that one question wrong. And I can tell you exactly what that question was and what answer I gave and what the right answer was. And that was longer ago than I care to remember. Um, so that originally was meant to do something. Those things were all, you know, we created driver's licenses to do something. We write a grocery list to do something. We developed the idea of checks to do something. Um, and more often than not, they do those things and nobody pays any attention to it. And then off they go. And once in a while, they, they go on. They have second or third or subsequent lives and you know the the canceled check for paying for my hospital stay when I was born is no I mean it is of no use as a canceled check. Nobody's going to come back this many years later and say that. But the fact that my mother kept that and that was a connection between you know the week I was born and I mean that thing is almost as old as I am within a few days and it, it's just you know to see my mother's signature on it to see my father paid for the hospital my mother paid for the doctor like why you know what that makes no sense those kinds of things they're now far more resonant of my family and and my origins and so on and i think you know everybody has something everybody has some object some document some piece of paper some something that originally was doing some one thing and now oh well you know now it's not a you know it's not a grocery list anymore it's something in my grandmother's handwriting that i can remember a student id or a driver's license or a tuition bill have a purpose now yep and may have a very different purpose 40 or 50 years from now mm-hmm. you had a slide that i i found so compelling you made the case that we are information keepers we can't help but to to do this. But you had a slide that had an image of a 30,000 year old jawbone representing a lunar cycle. And in that same doc, in that same slide was a document from the Soviet period in Russia, a typed message that would have been considered illegal, if not dangerous at that time. And in that same image, you had a selfie that, as best I can tell, had Ellen DeGeneres, Bradley Cooper, Brad Pitt, and I think I saw a Harry Potter image in that same, all in one slide. What was that slide doing for you? Uh, I, I use that as well in my, in my classes. And it's, it's to make the point that, uh, you know, as an information scientist, I was originally try, trained as a librarian, but as an information scientist, information is one of those concepts that everybody thinks they, knows, but they, thinks they know, but they really don't. Um, because they don't think about it, because it's rarely the point. Um, you know, people take a selfie to remember where they were at a particular time and place and maybe post it to Instagram. People uh, you know, write fan fiction because they wanna personalize a story or make it go further. People record the lunar cycle on a bone because who knows why, right? I mean, because look, I saw this in the sky and it happens every this many days and it must mean something, right? So we, we do this to achieve some objective, to remember something, to do some kind of work, to, you know, to, to the, the information is a means to an end. It's almost never an end unto itself. And yet, you know, there's a connectivity through this. Civilizations all over the world developed writing to, to record things, to, to remember things. Almost every civilization developed some sort of medium in which to write, whether that was clay or paper or papyrus or stone. So there's the, you know, this concept that we are information beings, that it's crucial to who we are as people and as societies. I think that's a point worth making and that there's a universality about that. This is, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing spe- specific about that. It's, it's been going on since we were human. You give us ways of thinking about the stuff, that, and that's your word, stuff that we, that we collect. Some of it is fleeting, some of it is temporary. It's ephemeral, like the notes from your lecture. Um, 
It can be long lasting, like the ration book. And then there are things that are meant to last forever, like the Rosetta Stone. Talk about things that are meant to, to last forever, and those things that are fleeting, Snapchats and, and things like that. Talk, talk about those categories and how we think about Yeah, and, and here we have the difference between intentionality and what really happens. So, you know, the ration book was not meant to last forever. It's fairly flimsy paper, and, you know, some of those have survived. You can probably get them on the collectibles market, but... The idea that that it's still around, what, 75 years later is, again, completely useless as a ration book. The Rosetta Stone was meant to last forever, but it was because the ancient Egyptians thought their society would last forever. And this was, you know, this was holding up the dynasty, propping it up. And it was literally propped up against temples. There were multiple versions of it. We have other examples now. And it was literally meant to prop up the dynasty and, and, you know, for a boy king to not be, you know, murdered by the priests at the time. And, and, but it has lasted 2,200 years for entirely different reasons, and now it serves entirely different purposes. So some things that were meant to last forever didn't. Societies fall, civilizations fall, um, uh, you know, they come and go. And some things completely accidentally or incidentally go on much longer than they ever were meant to. And there's, you know, it's, the prediction business is, is a tricky one. Um, things some things that were meant to last forever so the 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 golden records that were attached to the voyager spacecraft and sent out into space with you know music and speech and pictures and such like that we think that will last effectively forever that may be the longest lived human artifact ever because there's nothing to stop it we don't think unless the first star trek movie was a documentary um uh but who knows, right? That we will not live, nobody will live to see what the ultimate outcome of that is. And, and you know, something that somebody is creating right now, somewhere here in Seattle or somewhere else, archaeologists could dig up in 10,000 years, and there's no way to know, and we will never know. And they will make of it what they make of it. You're leading us somewhere important because you encourage us to look at repositories, look into them, libraries, museums, and pose certain questions. What's there, what's not there? Who is there, who is not, and who decides? You also quote Hamilton, who lives, who dies, who tells your story, and you add, who keeps your story is important. So talk about the importance of repositories and who keeps our story. Any, any collection, any repository, and, and this is, you know, great libraries like ours and great museums and, and archives and other kinds of, you know, grandiose sort of things. I, I also give the example of Google. You could, any collection of things, um, information things, whatever, the, the, you know, your email inbox uh, or the emails that you file away, your, you know, the text messages that you save, et cetera. Any collection involves decision making. What stays, what goes, what you keep, what you pitch. And, and a good deal of what archivists do, for example, is decide what to get rid of because it's too much to keep. So um, uh, any collection, anytime you see a collection or a repository, decisions have been made on some set of criteria by some set of people who are in a position to make those decisions and enforce them. None of that's you know, sinister, it just happens. Librarians make collection development decisions, archivists make you know, uh, decisions about what to keep, uh, museums make acquisitions decisions, it happens all the time. It's not, it's not sinister, it just happens. But, but you, you kind of don't think about that. So you go to the library and you see certain kind of books and you don't see certain kind of other books and well, that must mean that those books are more important. Well, maybe, but it also means that that's what, the, that's what the, those people picked. And maybe it makes sense for that community to have those books and this community to have these. Museums have certain kinds of art, they don't have other kinds of art. Those are just decisions. And, and those decisions are just inherent in the idea of collection, in the idea of keeping in, re, in a repository. And it's just, you know, I, I think we are increasingly aware of the potency of those decisions and who gets to make them and under what circumstances and who's in there and who isn't and, and what gets kept and what doesn't and why. And that's just always good questions to ask. You take us to an important part of this course, an important anchor for this course, and for our thinking about 2020, which is the time capsule, which, which I'm going to make the case is your idea, Joe, that comes from a conversation that you and I had as we were 
leaving our building, unpacking our things and, and walking away from the Seattle campus with the realization that we may not be coming back for a while, that this, um, that this pandemic in 2020 was actually quite serious and that we were asking our students to leave and our faculty were leaving. And, and you, you, you come to a memory of your grandmother who was born in 1898. Tell us about that story and how that's significant to us now. I, I did not make that connection. One of the last objects that I decided to show in that lecture was the egg, which is really a lemon, I get it. Um, and I thought, oh, I should have grandma's egg. And I, mm. and I did not make, I wrote down the year in that she was born, 1898. And in writing on my notes, in writing that down, I thought, oh my gosh, she was 20 when the flu pandemic hit, which is roughly the same age of some of our incoming students. And she never said a word about it. I never asked because I didn't connect it until three days ago. She didn't talk about it. I didn't ask. And, and there's all these untold stories about billions of things, but there's all these untold stories about that, that I wish I had asked her and I wish she had said. And for some reason, she just never talked about it. She never talked about a bunch of things, but she never talked about it. So, no, excuse me, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so that object kind of, you know, brought me to the, oh my gosh, my, my grandmother was the age of my students when the last pandemic hit. So there's a kind of, you know, that's a full circle moment. And now we pose this idea of a time capsule inviting students to our students and community, right? Mm -hmm to contribute to a time capsule. Talk about this concept of a time capsule and how we might develop this. I'm gonna ask you to talk about it now, and I'll ask you to come back during the mm -hmm. course and, and help us frame it and, um, and, and think about it more conceptually. But, but tell us more about this time capsule. Delighted to. Uh, well, as I said in the lecture, there's, you know, the, the, some things have just been kept, you know, walled up inside buildings and forgotten, that kind of thing, or shoe boxes or whatever. The idea of intentionally putting a group of things together to represent a particular time for a particular other time Time. It's relatively recent. It's more or less 20th century. It kind of comes out of the 30s, um, the Depression era, for whatever reason, probably a series of reasons. Um, and and the, the, my favorite, I think I used this in the lecture, my favorite ex uh, way of characterizing a time capsule is that it's a posed portrait. So, you know, whatever, whatever survives, you get kind of bits and pieces of, you know, ration books and certificates and so on. But this is a way to put together, you know, the family portrait where you're all supposed to dress nice and, you know, you put your best foot forward kind of thing. And, and that's a nice way to put it. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but that's, I mean, it's an intentional collecting of things to represent a time, a place, a community, an event, et cetera. They're often, you know, to be opened in a hundred years at a centennial kind of celebration, that sort of thing. But there's an intentionality to the assembly and decision-making and collections about things to instruct the future about how to think about us, to inform the future. Um, and they're, you know, intermittently successful. Some don't survive, some get forgotten, some don't, some wind up with sludge in them, et cetera but as a way to kind of memorialize the present in the way we are thinking about it now, with intentionality, with purpose. And I would also argue what you don't often find in time capsules is context and rationale. Why do you pick this? What does this story tell? You know, if you find a ration book, that doesn't necessarily tell you anything, but I, you know, I, I saved this one stamp because by God, I was going to have one stamp left at the end of the war, which is probably what my mother was thinking. Or, you know, I do, just in case they bring rationing back, I want a stamp. That was actually my mother. Um, uh, that, that piece of the story, you know, if you just have the thing itself, if you don't have the rationale, the description, the context, you lose a little something. So the idea of being, a, and I put that slide up that had nothing, right, with a question mark. What is, what is the thing that, that 2020 will be remembered for? What is the thing that, that each of us individually will remember this year um, for? That's an open question. We're still living through it. Um, and uh, that, the open question of what goes in that frame um, to inform an unknown future about this present um, is is a question worth worth poking at? I think. So I'll invite you back to talk to our students and our community about our time capsule, our 2020 time capsule, and what will contribute to that. What will write? What will what will place? In, what we will place in that capsule? 
I want to end with, with your words from the end of your lecture, and I just want you to reflect on what you said here because I found this particularly poignant. You said, 2020 will be a year we will never forget, but we will not be eager to remember. This is an opportunity to provide context, shape, detail, focus for people who are going to want to know what this time was like and how we felt about it. What was it like? How did it feel? How did we experience this? Say more about that. Uh, so I've listened to a couple of, I've done some reading and listened to a couple of um, talks and lectures about the flu pandemic, about the 1918-19 flu pandemic. Very little was, very little is left, comparatively little is left. And there's a bunch of, of uh, you know, potential explanations for that, that it was wrapped up in the end of World War I. I, I just watched a documentary the other night about the, the fight for women's suffrage in the United States, which finally succeeded in 1920 it, it, after 70 years, but the real focal point was 1918-19. And this four-hour documentary about women's suffrage, not a word about, they talked about the war, they talked about Woodrow Wilson, they talked about the Democrats and the Republicans, not a single word about the fact that the final push to get the 19th Amendment passed was done in the face of a, of a global pandemic. And a year ago, it wouldn't have crossed my mind. Like, oh yeah, World War I, yeah, Woodrow Wilson, whatever, right, not a word. I think part of the reason, and we understand that now, given where we are and where we've been over the last several months, I think part of the reason of that is they just didn't want to think about it anymore. It's just exhausting. It occupies your every moment, every decision you make, every, everything you want to do, every, I mean, what aspect of human society is unaffected by this? It, it, it just is so all-consuming that uh, who's ever going to want to talk about this anymore? We're already starting to hear euphemisms. You know, I'm doing it too. That time, that year. Oh, yeah, that was 20. Oh, right, right. <clears throat> right. Let's just start over. Let's just reset, right? So, and people in the future, after this is forgotten, after we're all older and, you know, we're, are going to wonder, like, what, like we wonder about 1918, 19. We have very little insight. So this is an opportunity for us to be intentional about that, and particularly for our students who are living through a, a, a deeply unique, uh, you know, last several months and, and few months to come. What is it like? What was it like? What, what did you feel? What were you mad about? What were you happy about? What were you frustrated by? What, what, how does this leave you? Um, a future generation of UW students, community members, whoever, are going are gonna to be thrilled to look at this and think, oh, that's what it was like. That's what people thought. That's what. So it's an opportunity to create history in two different ways. We are making history in the actions we do, and we are making history by putting stuff away so that the future generation can, can re-engage with it and then better understand who we are and what we felt. You began with story about your mother and father and documents that mattered to them, to you. And you ended with exaltation of Inanna and a, a document created, a document by Etuana, Princess Priestess, first known author. And you close with saying, everyone wants to be able to say, I was here, I mattered, I have a story to tell, and I want to be remembered. We want to be heard, understood, and remembered. And with Ed Hedwana mm -hmm. and this notion of being remembered and, and tell us, tell our students and our community why it matters and, and why memory in the end is all we have. Think of all the billions of people who have ever lived all over the world, various shapes, sizes, right? All the billions of people. And the, the, almost every one of those people is forgotten. There is almost nothing left. Headstones, you know, for people in the last few hundred years, particularly in, in civilizations where they leave markers. Um, you know, a few scattered bits and pieces here and there. But the vast majority of people who have ever lived, there is nothing left. Um, there's a small number of people, you know, we know Napoleon, we know and Hedjuana, we know, you know, uh, uh, Cleopatra, we know a bunch of, but 
I mean, that's, it's a vanishingly small fraction of the human uh, species. And, and that's understandable, you know, you kind of think about it, it makes sense, but it's also kind of tragic. And, and, um, and, and part of, I think, because we all know we are mortal and we all know we will die, what we will leave behind is the memories we leave in other people's heads, which will eventually die when they die. And then whatever else we leave behind. And a few people leave things, enough things behind that last for a long time that they are remembered for a long period of time. And Hedjuana, one of the longest lived people ever. Um, she is certainly the longest lived author we know of. You know, somebody else, we might find something older, but um, she's the first person we know of who thought to write her own name down um, in ways that endured for thousands of years. And so we know who, sh she is one of the oldest women whose names we know and the, and the, the first known author. So there are, if you write it down, if you, if you record it, if you keep it, if it manages to survive, you can live forever. Very few people do, but the idea that we will be forgotten, that I will be forgotten, that you know, a few people will remember me for a few years and I'll leave, you know, I wrote some books and stuff and those will eventually wither to dust as well. The idea that I will be forgotten is unsettling, but, but I, you know, I understand it. Um, but you know, there's a chance that something I wrote, that something I did, that you know, some, some fragment of me will survive for a long time. And that's a little bit reassuring. But at the very least, I wanted to, to at least you know, have something. And, and the opportunity to have something that endures beyond my lifespan is, um, is something I think we all would hope for. Dr. James, thank you so much for giving us good reason to be remembered. Thank you. Thank you.